Well, our next thought leader is Joe Foley from uh, Stanford School of Medicine, and he's going to tell you about a revolutionary method that combines laser capture microdissection and smart 3 seq a streamlined version of RNA-seq. He can, and can accept small RNAs, and I think it's going to have a much higher yield for direct application to do many different research projects. Take it away, Joe. All right, thanks, Lance, for that kind of introduction. So I'm going to come uh, full circle back to the original topic of uh, Lance's presentation, which is uh, new applications for laser capture micro dissection, and in this case, uh, gene expression profiling, and I'll show you some examples of multi-omics at the end. So uh, we're interested in these four topics. Uh, we're working with uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, which is uh, archived clinical tissue we get from the operating room sometimes, uh, which is great for durability. We have samples that are 20 years old, still giving good results. But on the other hand, uh, just the event of the fixation itself is sufficient to degrade nucleic acids, in particular RNA, uh, to the extent that a lot of techniques just don't work on FFPE tissue. and that's why we have postdocs who have to get up in the middle of the night to get fresh tissue from the operating room for other approaches. But uh, we're working on uh, applying methods to FFPE because that unlocks potentially billions of FFPE blocks stored in pathology departments around the world. Uh, Lance already introduced laser captured micro dissection, but I'll show you more about how we're applying that. And we're combining it with this new approach, Smart 3 Seek, which is a uh, a new method of RNA-seq that has some advantages for this application. Ultimately, the goal is to do gene expression profiling as a comprehensive phenotype, a molecular phenotype of everything going on in molecule at the level of uh, expression of RNAs. So or anything else, I should explain exactly what this smart 3 seq is. Uh, briefly, uh, it's a pathway to go from, uh, from total RNA to a sequencing ready cDNA library in just a few steps. It starts with uh, fragmenting the RNA down to the size you need for Illumina sequencers on the order of 100 to maybe uh, 500 nucleotides. Uh, and that becomes important because when we're working with FFPE tissue, the RNA is already degraded usually even further than that. Then uh, basically in a single incubation, we take advantage of template switching, reverse transcription. That's the, the SMART method from the late 1990s applied in SmartSeq and SmartSeq2 later on, uh, which is highly sensitive and uh, involves using an oligo-DT primer that includes the first sequencing adapter. Then at the other end of the molecule, after the first strand is synthesized, the innate behavior of reverse transcriptase is to add a short tail of primarily cytosine which allows us to anneal a second adapter, the second sequencing adapter that has a corresponding G overhang. And then the same enzyme in the same incubation fills in the second strand of cDNA. So in that one incubation, we've gone from single-stranded RNA template to a double-stranded, uh, double adapter labeled cDNA. All that's required after that is add the PCR reagents. Uh, and then there's only one single cleanup step before the final completion of the library. So the key points here are because we start with fragmentation, uh, the RNA can already be fragmented, which is in contrast to the SMART methods that I mentioned earlier, but analogous to the 3 seq method from our lab many years ago. Uh, and because there are so few steps, in particular so few cleanups, we lose very little material along the way. This is crucial for the sensitivity of the method. So on the right, I have an example of a standard curve using the ERCC standards, which are RNAs of known quantity. Uh, and you can see the method is extremely accurate for going from uh, the read count from smart 3 seq which is a three prime end targeted method, which means you're just getting one read per original RNA transcript uh, to the copy number of the molecule. And we show in the paper that this sensitivity extends down with reasonably good accuracy even to the single cell amounts of input. So just to compare this method with others, uh, as I said, there are very few steps and we've also done it in very small reaction volumes. So the cost of reagents is very low. Uh, the amount of RNA you need is quite small also because of the sensitivity of the SMART method in particular, as well as the, the small number of steps that we have to do uh, to turn it into a library. And it's a short protocol. Strand 
specificity is preserved, which is important for complex genomes like human. Uh, unlike some of the other single cell methods, uh, RNA can be damaged before it goes into the protocol. Then we essentially just skip fragmenting it. But uh, crucially for the rest of this presentation, we've optimized the protocol to work directly on cells or tissue. What I mean by that is rather than do you know, a spin column cleanup, isolate the RNA, measure it on a spectrophotometer, and then possibly even do a ribosomal depletion, we can go directly from a crude lysate uh, into the uh, the three prime end priming with the oligo DT, which effectively takes care of ribosomes anyway. So we have this method optimized to use one entire tissue sample, uh, including from an LCM cap, which is which is what enables uh, combining this approach with laser capture and micro dissection. So this is uh, the general principle: is this new RNA seq approach, and you can use it for basically a substitute for a kit if you want to save money and do large scale experiments. But for the rest of the talk, I'm going to discuss a specific application that takes advantage of these strengths, which is with laser capture micro dissection. So this is just a brief example. Lance introduced this a lot in detail already. Uh, we use the Arcturus XT system for LCM. And you can see this is a, essentially a single cell layer, actually slightly thinner in order to know exactly which cells we're getting, seven microns for FFPE. And with some difficulty, we're able to cut out regions as small as a single cell. So essentially, our histology slides are not just read-only. We can now cut and paste a specific piece of tissue that we've drawn, as Lance said, with a mouse or a stylus and uh, robotically transfer it to a, an adhesive capture medium, the cap. And so that's what you see in the lower right. We've managed to get one cell out. Uh, that doesn't always work. It depends on the type of tissue, how far apart the cells are. And in some cases, we have to uh, destroy extraneous cells with the UV laser. But uh, as a proof of concept, we show it can be done. And, and so we go on to show uh, we can actually get usable data out of this too. So this is an example where on the left, we've done what we call bulk tissue, which to us means about 100 cells or more. Uh, from two regions of uh, a case from a HER2 positive duffel carcinoma in C2, we have uh, a group of bulk macrophages and a group of bulk DCIS tumor cells. And we can see, as you'd expect, a nice clear separation uh, on the left of the expression profiles between those. But then when we go on to dissect single cells with LCM, we find when we dissect uh, single macrophages, the, the large blue column, they do generally resemble the bulk macrophages with the, the caveat that the data quality is you know, much more sparse because of the small number of molecules from a single cell. When we dissect single cells out of the tumor, that's the red on the end, uh, we actually find two different subpopulations. One that uh, looks in fact like the macrophages and another that looks like the, the DCIS bulk tissue. And since this was a HER2 positive case, we saw a major amplification of the HER2 or ERBB2 locus, which was visible as a much higher expression of that gene and of many neighboring genes. And that uh, amplification, which we identified just from the Smart3Seq data, was clear on uh, the single cells as well. So essentially, and we show in the paper a few additional markers, uh, what we found was half of the cells we dissected out of the, the tumor or tumor cells, and half were in fact infiltrating macrophages, which is something we would have missed even if we had done the, the bulk LCM. And so that prompts a conceptual comparison of how this approach uh, works in, in light of other uh, emerging methods in both single cell and spatial transcriptomics. So on the top, uh, we're imagining this as a forward approach to RNA-seq where we start with micro dissection. We know exactly what each sample is because we've done the histology, we can see where we're cutting. And so then when we profile the, the tissue, we can compare using the, the prior knowledge of which cell type is which uh, to see patterns between different uh, types of cells. That's in contrast uh, to the second approach, which is microfluidic separation. And this would be what is normally called single cell RNA-seq, although that name can be a little confusing because what's actually happening is you take on the order of 100,000 cells, completely homogenize them. So you lose all of the information about uh, 
of both the spatial information and the histological information, then about 10,000 of them go into being profiled with relatively low amount of data per cell. But uh, as Amanda was showing earlier, that can be very useful when you just want to know all of the types of cells in the tissue, then you cluster them and essentially retroactively you infer which cluster of cells was which type. So, so we envision that as sort of a reverse approach to RNA-seq that has its, its own applications in different kinds of problems. And I know we have a, a whole session of an upcoming webinar devoted just to that topic, the single cell uh, genomics. Uh, finally, uh, Another spatial approach, spatial transcriptomics, is uh, sort of a shotgun method where rather than uh, uh, painstakingly microdissect each individual uh, region of a sample that you want, uh, you just apply a grid of capture spots over the entire uh, slide. And that has some major benefits. It's much easier to do on a very large scale. Uh, but you don't get to choose exactly where the spots are. So it also has some downsides that if you have uh, for example, small or irregularly shaped lesions that you're interested in, uh, it can be a lot harder to get a pure signal, which is something we've always struggled with, uh, especially studying DCIS, that the lesions are small and far apart. Uh, but uh, it can be very useful in its own way, almost analogously to the, the reverse RNA-seq method in order to build an atlas of everything going on in a piece of tissue. So these are not, in my mind, competing methods. They're complementary. And in fact, in our lab, we're using all three of them. But I'm going to keep focusing on the first. So next, I'm going to show you some uh, papers from our lab where we've applied this combination of LCM and Smart3Seq. Uh, and this is mostly work done by other people. And I don't have time or the knowledge to get into all the intricate details of what they did. But I'm going to focus on the, the technical challenges that, uh, that they had to solve along the way. So first is uh, a case of difficult histology, as I was just describing. Uh, sometimes the shape of your lesion is not convenient to dissect. In this case, uh, uh, Emilia was working with uh, herpes infections, looking at uh, epithelium on the skin. The epidermis is where the infection stops. It doesn't get into the dermis, which means when you look at these on a slide, you get very unusual shapes. You can see what she had to work with on the right to cut those out. And then uh, when she dissected just the infected tissue, you can see on the lower left, uh, when it was infected with an actual virus of four different genotypes, the percent of the reads that were aligned to genes from the, vi from the virus rather than the host human tissue could actually be very high. This was good at uh, getting relatively pure viral samples, and especially considering the size of the viral genome that resulted in very high coverage. Whereas when she infected with a bias, when she dissected a bystander tissue next to the infection, but not containing uh, uh, necrotic tissue, usually the signal from the virus was very low, as you'd hope. And when she did a mock infection with no virus at all, again, basically noise. But there are a few exceptions you can see where we got too much virus from bystander or not enough from uh, infected tissue. The reason for that, we think, is that in order to reduce the amount of handling on the uh, the slide that she used for LCM and Smart3Seq, Emilia actually took several consecutive sections of the same tissue block and used a different section uh, to do her stains to identify where the infected tissue was. So she was sort of guessing from slide one uh, where to cut on slide two, or in some cases it was slide three or four, because if you've done a uh, microtome, you know not every section comes out nice. So that distance can create a little bit of inaccuracy. and that leads into uh, this next example where uh, we took advantage of that consecutive sectioning approach to do uh, essentially multi-omics uh, since consecutive sections of the same block should have pretty much the same uh, tissue type, the same lesions in this case in the same place on each slide. We can actually uh, use different copies of the same tissue to do different analyses. So here's an example where Pepe did a uh, fish to literally count the number of copies of the HER2 locus in this HER2 positive case. Uh, but then she used consecutive sections, uh, not just for histology, but for one for SMART3Seq and one for shallow whole genome sequencing, just enough to identify large structural variations, in particular, the number of copies of the HER2 locus. So you can see on the right, 
there was, of course, some correspondence between the gene expression from that HER2 locus, but it was still very useful to be able to subdivide this HER2 positive case into the number of copies uh, in each cell or in each, each lesion uh, according to the, the DNA sequencing data. And so these were two complementary pieces of data, somewhat correlated, but very helpful to have both. And then using those in the paper, she goes on to, in fact, reconstruct the evolutionary tree of uh, how this tumor progressed as it uh, both in time and as it moved through space on the slide and accumulated more copies of her too. And finally, I mentioned that the, the cost per library is quite low. So that means in addition to scaling down to uh, very low inputs, we can also scale up to very large projects. And in fact, this is something Daniel mentioned, the, the challenge of having a pre-cancer atlas uh, our lab is in fact participating in a consortium of several labs working on one of those. And Siri just got the, the preprint out on BioArchive a couple of months ago. This is an, uh, an example where we have very large cohort of uh, uh, diagnoses from hundreds of patients. And in one arm of the study, we're doing, uh, well, first tissue microarrays, and then from those dissecting out consecutive sections to do uh, several multi-omic approaches, not just DNA and RNA, as I showed you before, but we're also working with Mike Angelo's lab to do MIBI, which is essentially a way to visualize dozens of proteins uh, locations in a single section. So just looking forward uh, to summarize where uh, Smart3Seq fits into existing methods and how we can uh, extend it into the future, a few parting thoughts. One is uh, LCM itself is being improved. I said we're using the Arcturus XT system, uh, but there's competition now from Fluidime, which has a system with improved uh, software and also in hardware, the, the cap that adheres to the tissue, which uh, hopefully will solve the problem we've had that sometimes it doesn't always stick on the first try. Uh, in our lab, we're still improving the smart free seq method and we have an overhauled protocol coming soon where among other things like uh, making it even faster and cheaper, we've managed to reduce a lot of the noise, both from reads that failed the chastity filter on the Illumina sequencer and from uh, PCR dimers that end up getting sequenced and essentially wasting your data. So from the same uh, amount of input, we're able to get more usable data in, in particular for uh, low inputs and degraded inputs like FFPE, LCM. Uh, we hope that this will rescue more of the borderline samples that had a high failure rate when you're working with very difficult tissue. And finally, uh, we're still expanding the portfolio of multi-omic assays that we can use with laser capture microdissection. Uh, Smart FreeSeq is just a part of it. Uh, we're limited in our lab by what we can do with uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, which rules out a lot of assays. For example, a tax seek would have been nice, but we've become convinced that that's impossible with FFPE tissue. Instead, uh, to look at epigenetic signal, we have a new method coming soon that studies DNA methylation. And I hope I'll have more to say about that when we meet next year in Florence. So uh, I want to acknowledge all of the people who've uh, contributed and are still contributing to this research, our, our funders, and of course the, the tissue donors who in many cases now have donated their tissue before knowing exactly what we'd be able to do with it or even before the methods we're applying were invented. And thank you all for your time.